Well, it's great to be back in Douglas. First Sunday of uh, 2013. I can tell you already, Christmas and New Year's a blur, isn't it? Apart from the waistline, which isn't quite a blur. But I uh, got to see a little bit of telly over Christmas. I don't know if you did. One of, one of the best programs I saw over the Christmas period was the new BBC series, Africa. Anybody watch it? Phenomenal series. If you haven't watched it, get it on your BBC iPlayer or download on your iPad for when you're traveling uh, because it all came back. Do you know like my trip to Botswana and Zambia and South Africa this year, it all came back to me watching that uh, particular series. Uh, and I thought about Tracker Dave as well. If you haven't caught any of Tracker Dave's uh, video productions, uh, go to the Carly Groves website and uh, you'll see uh, some of them. But the first episode was set in the Kalahari uh, Desert and it was simply amazing because in the midst of oppressive and arid uh, heat and an arid land, uh, there was a feature about what was happening around this green little part within the desert in Namibia. And for those of you who saw it, it showed uh, two male giraffes having a ding-dong over a female giraffe. Uh, it really, if you watch, you need to watch it because I thought it was better than the thriller in, uh, thriller in Manila. You know, it was that type, of, that type of fight that was going on and the, the old giraffe suddenly gives a, a big uppercut at the end and knocks the young guy flying for, and he's out cold for about three minutes. But uh, you're going to have to watch that. But uh, in this uh, barren desert, it's amazing, trees are able to grow and giraffes, desert giraffes, are actually thriving. And it turns out that these trees that you'll see on the TV feature actually have the ability to put their roots down into the underground water table between 30 and 50 meters. Isn't that amazing? Not 30 or 50 feet, but the root system for these trees in Namibia can go right down to 30 to 50 meters, and there they, they tap into the water. And that's a picture, I believe, for us as we start 2013 of what God wants us to do with Him, to be able to go deep with Him. So, so often, you know, when we face curved balls, uh, we wilt or we, we give up. But God wants us to learn to have the ability to go deep with Him so that we can draw nutrients, so we can be refreshed by Him. Now, I don't know what 2013 has in store for you. I know that there's going to be a lot of joy in 2013, right? I know we're going to advance the kingdom together in 2013. But one thing I also know is that Jesus says, in 2013, you're going to have troubles. That's a given. I'm not here to depress you, but the reality is, uh, one thing you can count on in 2013 is, you will have troubles. But Jesus says, take courage because I have overcome the world. And when you have troubles, I want us all as individuals and corporately to know how to get deep into God so that whether it looks like a desert out there, we're the type of people that will still be green, still have joy. I mean, joy is easy to have and everything's going well, isn't it? You know, when you're in good health and the money's coming into your bank account and, you know, church is going well and your ministry team, that's an easy time to have joy. But real joy isn't dependent on the circumstances. Real joy comes from our relationship with Jesus. Now, it would be so easy for me to default to, here's five things you need to do in order to have joy. But unlike all other world religions, you know, Christianity isn't based on five pillars or eight things in a path. You know, Christianity is all about Jesus, the person of Jesus. Joy is to be found in, in Jesus. Jesus says, you know, come to me. He makes himself the center. He doesn't point to this or that. He makes himself, come to me. If you're weary or burdened, you know, come to me. I am the life. You know, I'm the way. It's all about Him. And in 2013, I want us to know and to be able to learn how to go deeper with Jesus, how to know Him more deeply. And actually, I want us to become friends of God. 
You know, that's kind of where I want to kick off today, really. If, if, if there's anything that's going to happen in my life in 2013, is that my friendship with God has become much more deep. Because it's possible in a church like ours that we miss out on the real deal, friendship with God, and we exchange that for, for dead religion, for works. You know, uh, we all use various words to describe what it means to be a Christ follower, to be a Christian. But look at what Jesus says in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. Isn't that amazing that Jesus describes his followers? This will be a, a litmus test for you. Jesus describes, if you're really one of my followers, here's the relationship we have. You're my friend. And this isn't just a New Testament description, because if you dig into the Old Testament, you see throughout the Old Testament, men and women of God were known as the friends of God. Abraham in Isaiah 41 and verse 8 is referred to as, as God's friend. It was the same as for Moses as well in Exodus 33, 11. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And literally that Hebrew there means that they spoke mouth to mouth. Let me also highlight something for many of you I think you might have never noticed. Numbers 12, 68. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him or her in visions. I speak to him or her in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. And when I speak with him, I speak face to face. Clearly, and not in riddles, he sees the form of the Lord. You see, so many evangelicals and Pentecostals, they kind of think that this friendship with God thing is for those who are, you know, like prophets in the church or those who are in leadership or eldership in the life of the church. Uh, friendship with God, like, for instance, when we met Andrew Selly, it was clear, Andrew really knows Jesus. You know, Andrew really Hears from Jesus. I've met Nikki and Gumbel and Sandy Milder. And when you're with them, you know, Sandy prayed with me so I could have start praying in tongues and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when you're with them, you care. These guys know Jesus. They hear from Jesus. And very often you kind of have these superheroes. They're the people that are going to speak face to face. But here it says, you know, with God's friends, I speak face to face. Actually, with the prophets, there's maybe more of a missing piece, a, a riddle, a dream. But with my friends, it's going to be clear. We're going to speak face to face, mouth to mouth. This is for God's friends. And even in the Song of Solomon, that great piece of poetic literature, which also is a, is a picture of Christ and the church, the relationship here is of my lover and my friends. We all know the story of Job, isn't that right? Job lost almost everything. His health, his, his children, his, his wealth, his uh, position, his friends. What was it that Job missed the most? Job 29 and 4. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime. Not when he was playing for the local football or cricket team. <laughs> When, he was in my, when I was in my prime, you know, not when I was able to rack it out in the guitar like this or that or something else. Oh, the days when I was in my prime when God's intimate friendship blessed my house. And I'm sure the question we're already all asking uh, isn't, is it possible for Abraham or Moses or Job to be God's friend? What we really want to know is, is it possible for me to be God's friend? Can I really know God in such a way that he touches the deepest part of my spirit? Spirit of spirit. Maybe you're thinking, well, how is friendship with a holy God possible? 
You know, I remember uh, sharing this uh, a while back, and this woman said to me, oh, my mother always said to me, who, quoting from the Psalms, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Only he has clean hands and a, and a pure heart. And after all, none of us have clean hands or, or a pure heart. And many of us are in that category, aren't we? You know, well, none of us is God's holy, God's out there, I'm down here. It's a bit like Christmas time. Thankfully, I have never got sucked into watching Downton Abbey. But uh, Annette has in the last few months, and suppose, like the rest of you, she was depressed at Christmas time uh, watching. Anybody depressed watching Downton Abbey at Christmas time? Yeah, you see, you all were. Yeah, you watched the wrong, wrong thing. And, you know, like Downton Abbey, it's a bit like Upstairs, Downstairs, which was a, uh, an older, you know, television series. You have, you know, those in fine clothes who live upstairs. And then, and then you have those who are the servants who live downstairs and they like and respect one another, but they don't share life together. There's no real connection together you know there's the working class and then there's the and then there's the upper class masters and masters and servants they don't become friends sure they don't it kind of breaks everything and i and i did notice when i glimpsed at it for five minutes <laughs> that part of the storyline was about somebody who had been a servant and now he's no longer a servant and ireland. from ireland <laughs> I think he got somebody pregnant or something like that didn't he i don't know anyways <laughs> but uh, you know there's this kind of and, uh, and one of the servants comes in and says, why aren't you, you're not allowed to eat with us anymore, you know. And this is the kind of relationship that's uh, going on. But if you think of it like God, God is mighty, God is awesome, God is holy. You talk about the rich and powerful being upstairs. Well, I mean, God is on the millionth floor penthouse suite when it comes to that. Remember Mount Sinai? Moses bringing God's people to Mount Sinai. And God says, tell the people, I'm going to come downstairs. <laughs> you know, I'm going to come down the mountain. And, and tell the people, don't even touch the mountain. You know, if they touch, they don't even, you know, create a border and boundaries. You know, they're going to die if they come too close. I mean, that's the ultimate mind the gap, isn't it? <laughs> you know, mind the gap. Because God is holy. I mean, that's what the angels say. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we are unholy. Remember when Isaiah had this encounter with God in the temple? And it says the glory of God filled the temple. It wasn't the case of, well, God, I'm going to be reverent to God. And I'm going to be in the pew in the temple. And I'm going to sing my hymn. And I'm going to be really serious and miserable. You know, like Isaiah is on his face, isn't he? Oh, what a sinful man I am. But the God of holiness did come downstairs. That's what Christmas has all been about, isn't it? God left heaven and came to earth. And the great news and the good news is that through Jesus' death on the cross, love came down. Mind the gap, well, Jesus overcame the gap. He not only took the fall for our sins on the cross, but we also discover that He gave us His holiness, and He gives us His righteousness so that we can bear to be in the presence of God, so that we can enjoy that intimate friendship. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says this, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Regina talked about boldness in one of those prophetic words. There's lots of boldness, but I think what living hope need is not only boldness in reaching people for Jesus, but bold when we're worshiping. Okay, I'm not going to just stand there and you know, pretend that God's upstairs and I'm down here and there's this big gulf between us. No, I'm going to be bold and I'm going to press right into God's presence. Because we can enter heaven's most holy place because, not of us, because of the blood of Jesus. Let us go right into the presence of God. That's the invitation. So do you get the point this morning? Uh, you know, God is still holy. 
We still sing majesty. We still uh, fall on our knees. God is holy. He made heaven and earth. He's beyond our imagination. But the great news is, you've all seen the painting, haven't you? He stretches out his hands and he says, will you be my friends? Was that Michelangelo? Yeah. Will you be my friend? And in fact, we don't live downstairs anymore, do we? Do we? Because in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, we read that we are seated with Christ where? In the, in the heaven. So we're upstairs with him. Yes, you know, like Jesus, we serve. We serve our world. We serve one another. But our identity is as, is as friends. And Jesus wants to draw all of our family into, into such a relationship whereby we have a friendship with him. And when you're friends with somebody, you share somebody's heart. You share somebody's passions. You share their desires. You and I serve Jesus not, not because of his orders, but because we love him. And so Jesus says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I've made known to you. Yes, the twelve had been his servants, his messengers, his students, his disciples, uh, his ambassadors. They had done works like him. But that wasn't enough. Jesus says, I want you to be my friends. And that's what he says to us at the start of 2013. I want you to be my friends. The choice we have to make today is to be, what, which of the two brothers are we going to be? Remember the story of the prodigals in Luke 15? Are we going to be like the older brother who sees his identity in, all oh, these years I have slaved for you, I have served you, Father, and you haven't even thrown a party for me, but then this son of yours comes home? Are we going to have a, a servant mentality or are we going to trust the Father and we're going to come to Him? And even though we feel, oh, I can only be a servant because that's what He says when He's eating pig swill. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say this, I'm no longer fit. Make me one of your servants. But do you notice that when He gets to His Father, read it when you get home in Luke 15, His Father doesn't allow Him to say that phrase. He says everything else. But when he comes to his father, his father says, quick, you know, put the best robe on him. Shoes, ring. Son is lost. Now he's fine. So certainly he's a son. And we're sons and daughters of the king, but he wants us to be his friends. Great, isn't it, eh? Friendship with God. So how can I deepen, just in these last 10 to 15 minutes, how can I deepen my friendship with God? And I don't want to make it this sound like a five-point plan, but there are key biblical truths and principles that will help us deepen our friendship with God. I mean, if you're a Christ follower, you'll either be motivated to press into God by, well, your destination, your, your destiny or your desperation. Isn't that right? Now, the reality is, probably for the most part, <laughs> most of us press into God <laughs> because we're desperate. We go through times of crises. But Jesus wants us to see our destiny in him. Jesus wants us to delight in him. You know, he doesn't want us, I mean, it's great to have the discipline to come and reading God's word every day, etc. But it shouldn't be discipline that gets us into God's presence. It should be a delight in who he is and who his friends are. Like when we went back to Northern Ireland at Christmas time, there were just people we wanted to hang out with. You know, it wasn't, oh, we have to, we have to put this in our diary. No, we know we have a friendship with these people. We want to go for dinner. You know, we want to have a night out together. And that's how Jesus wants us to relate with him. So how, how do we deepen our, our friendship with Jesus? Get the roots down deep. Well, first of all, you know, I, I follow Jesus. And that's about the lordship issue. That's how we're going to move deep. We settle the lordship issue because that's foundational to becoming friends with Jesus. You see, friendship with God is not unconditional. Let me just say that. Friendship with God is not unconditional because Jesus said that you are his friends 
if you obey what I command. Didn't he? John 15. And so the fundamental question, if you and I are to go deep this year, the fundamental question we need to settle is, who's the boss? I mean, let me give you an example. In Mark 8, 33, Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You have in mind the things of God, but not the things of men. Peter was trying to lead Jesus, wasn't he? No, don't go the way of the cross. Don't go that way. Peter was trying to lead Jesus. And until you and I in our lives settle the issue of who's the boss, who's going to lead my life, then I'm always going to be stuck in first base. That's why Jesus said, if anyone's going to be my disciple, if anyone's going to follow me, he must deny himself daily. He must take up his cross and follow me. You know, every year I come alongside people who are searching. It's, it's great. And, and every year I see people come to know Jesus and, and uh, they put their trust in Him and, and they grow. But also every year I come across people and they initially start, but then they fall back or they don't move forward. It's not they don't believe the claims of Jesus, but they're not prepared to let Jesus lead in a particular area of their lives. And the reason our friendship doesn't deepen, the reason we can't get the roots down is, is because we know that to become friends with Jesus, we need to change aspects of how we're currently living. Jesus says, if you love me, John 14, you will obey my command. Equally, he also in John 14, 15, he talks about my friends obey my command. I saw when I was in America, I saw a bumper sticker uh, which read and stuck in my mind, you know, God is my co-pilot. And somebody else must have seen this because I then on another car, I saw another bumper sticker and said, you know, if God is your co-pilot, change seats. So friendship starts with following the path of Jesus for our lives. Allowing him to lead us in every area. That's what Lord means. In those days, you know, Caesar, that was one of the, the, the declarations or, that people made. Had to stand up to Caesar is Lord. I said, no, Jesus is the boss. I'm going to go his way. I'm going to go his way in 2013. In every area of my life. as we deepen our friendship with Jesus, we, we not, need not only uh, follow Him and settle this Lordship issue, but then we need to start walking with Him and settle the intimacy issue. There's a lovely uh, picture in, in the book of Genesis to describe what God's plan for man uh, and woman is. And we read in Genesis 3 that then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as He was walking in the cool of the day. I mean, I, I don't know how you read Genesis. Uh, theologians talk about this being an anthropomorphism. It's not a big word for, for Sunday. And I, thankfully, it wasn't a Hebrew or a Greek word. But an, it's giving God the characteristics of a human being. And so in order to describe the relationship between God and, and the first members of his creation, there's this imagery of God in the cool of the day walking with man and woman. I mean, some of the old sentimental hymns, you know, picked that up, didn't they? And he walks with me, and he talks with me. That's the type of experience the first men and women had. But we read in Genesis, it's our disobedience, our sin that fractures that intimacy with God. And so people, because of sin, because God's holy, ended up excluded from that depth of intimacy with God. You look at the promise of God. God. God's complete in Himself. He doesn't need me or you. But look at the heart of God when we read in Leviticus 26. I will walk among you and be your God. And you will be my people. You see, God wants that intimacy restored. And as you and I settle the lordship issue, there will be times in your life when, you know what? You just sense Jesus walking alongside you, prompting you giving you special insight and revelation. You know, it's like the two on the road to Emmaus. After Jesus was crucified and they think he's still in the tomb, Jesus appears to these two in the road to Emmaus. 
And as they walked with Jesus, they had been following him, but now as they walked with Jesus, they, they asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked with us on the road? And, and he opened the scriptures to us. You know, some people have been followers of Jesus for many years, but they have never experienced that level of intimacy. Now, this isn't arrogance. This isn't boldness in a negative way. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And the Lord wants us to have this type of relationship. And going back to what was said of Moses and the prophets, you know, it's not, this isn't just for the Andrew Sally. Do you know you mean, these people that you meet and you say, oh, they really, they hear, they hear from Jesus. And I'm sure there's people, maybe your small group leader or somebody else in the life of the church, and you, you say, oh my goodness, they just hear from Jesus and they know him. They don't just read about him, but they know him. And this is for all of us. And as we press forward this year, we can deepen our friendship with God based upon the work of Jesus on the cross. Not when we do. We receive his grace. We receive his promises. And you know what? He's going to meet with us in ways we have never met before. And then uh, lastly, it's, it's about going before the Lord. I suppose that's the inspiration issue. So the, the sequence is that in order to deepen our friendship, in order to get our roots down, we need to follow Jesus. That's where it starts. Then uh, we need to walk with Jesus. And then as we walk with him, what you're going to discover is that he sends us out before him on a mission. Just like John the Baptist you know, I will send my messenger ahead of you. He'll prepare your way. It's only when we're walking with God that we discover what's on God's heart. And then when we discover on what's on his heart, then God sends us out to do his work. You know, remember I talked about that encounter that Isaiah had and is recorded in Isaiah chapter 6 when he met with God. Remember that encounter in the train and the robe filled the temple? You know, how, how did that conclude with, with that encounter of intimacy? Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. You see, I think the problem with the modern Pentecostal and charismatic church is when we have encounters with God and we have encounters with God's presence, we want to pitch tents. You know, Peter, James, and John, this transfiguration of Jesus on top of the mountain and, and there's oh my shabba dabba do here oh we're all glowing in the dark it's like the Daz Blue Whitener isn't that great you know let's, let's build a big worship center here on the top of the mountain and that's how often it is for us isn't it but you know Jesus wanted us to, Jesus wanted them to have that encounter so they would go down the mountain and they would encounter evil and they would set a little boy and his family free And so as we follow Jesus and we walk with him and we start to get his heart, he'll start to inspire us to change his world and to advance the kingdom. That's what he does with his friends. Your know, friends share what's on our hearts. It's a two-way thing. You know, you're busy sharing what's on your heart and really, you know, Charlie's got a, a dream to help people who've been through addiction like Charlie has and stuff like that. But you know what, Charlie, you need to keep your ears open. What's on Jesus' heart? Or Jonathan has a dream and a plan. What's on Jesus' heart? And so to the disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, following, walking, that presence, until the end of the age. And I really think that this series, the 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 outcome of this series going deeper is that we are going to have a passion for reaching our island. Not for kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. That's the, because if, you're, if you have a genuine encounter with Jesus, you're going to get his heart.
the big questions of life. Right. Mm. But what techniques then do you use to get hold and to reach out to those young people in the first place? It, they mainly come through word of mouth. People have you know, an experience of God which often changes their lives and they say to their friends, come and see. And uh, people realize that it's not actually about rules or religion, it's about a relationship with God. That's the heart of it. Mm. And when they experience that relationship, I, I was an atheist. I came from a, an atheist background and I had an encounter with Jesus that radically changed my life. You were a lot, well, barrister. I was yeah. a barrister, yeah, but I was, I was a Christian barrister. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. as far away from Jesus yeah. as you can be. Yeah, so a radical life change. Yeah. When you say you had an, an encounter with Jesus, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I, 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 I read the New Testament. I, because people, I, I met people who said they, 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 ha, they knew Jesus, and I thought, well, what on earth are they talking about? They're completely mad. Mm -hmm. And so I, I read the New Testament because I wanted to find out what it was all about. And in the pages of the New Testament, it was, it was as if Jesus came alive. And I, I started to, to, to realize that you actually could know this person. And Johnny, you've yeah. recently found your religion again, haven't you, over the last few years? I, I went back looking because it's something that doesn't quite go away. I, I had yeah. a Christian upbringing, but I haven't always lived a Christian lifestyle. Oh, and never. I've, <laughs> I've fought against it, but um, I, I, I think innately there's something that, you know, there's a goodness there. I, 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 my parents, I think, are the people they are and got through what they got through yeah. Mm. Yeah. and managed to give me the upbringing they did because of the faith. Mm. But then, when it jars with things, it, there's a real thing to want to get rid of it, but it can't. Yeah. Well, it's doing you good. I mean, you're looking well. Yeah. well I'm looking great, yeah. but I'm breathing in the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, that, that's, that's not God. Well, that's just all right. me. Uh, listen, <laughs> I'm speaking at a slightly yeah. different tone. <laughs> well, we'll hope your diet is in good yeah, form. Yeah, yeah. We're just going to do a bit of singing now. Yeah, you're ready. It's thank time. You, Nikki, thank you, Nikki. Thank you. It's time thank you so for much. our favourite song here on The One Show. Are we ready? Oh, we're we're ready. Out. OK, yeah. Johnny Vegas there. You know, uh, just one of the things that hit me was, like in under three minutes, you know, uh, somebody who loves Jesus well, was able to share their story and was able to reach out to others in a, in a very powerful way. You know, when most people think about Christianity, maybe they've uh, had experiences as, as a child in the church, etc., and then move far away, they think about the older brother, don't they? I mean, we don't want anybody returning to meet the older brother first, do you? <laughs> they need to meet the father. He saw himself as a slave. He gave people only what they needed, not what, um, what, sorry, what they deserved, not what they needed. Legalistic party pooper. And there's nothing winsome about him. But uh, as we go deeper in 2013, and we're going to look at Abraham and how he went deep with God uh, next week, uh, I want us to discover Jesus' heart for us and for the world. And we're going to, I really believe we're going to get passionate about what he's passionate about. He's passionate about his bride. He's passionate about holiness. He's passionate about righteousness. And he's passionate about the advancement of the kingdom and the out of man and across the world. And he's passionate for our friends and our neighbors. You know what? And the great news is that Jesus is here. You know, Paul said to people, he's not far. And he longs to be our friend. And I really encourage you, don't keep him at arm's length any longer. Maybe some of us have done that in our Christian walk. I think key for us all is to settle the lordship issue. You know, who's going to be Lord? I mean, who's going to, who's going to shape your actions in life? The views of the government? <laughs> the views of the crowd? Or the views of Jesus? And as he leads you, he'll call you to walk alongside him. And he'll share his heart. And, and as you walk alongside him, he'll also give you insight into how he wants you to make a difference in our world. He'll send you out in his name.